Hey guys, Ken Smith. This is part three of my conversation with John Van Dyson. John is the, uh, he oversees Texas uh, Park and Wildlife's uh, area for fisheries biologists that handles aquatic invasive species. So this is part three of five. This is the part though, guys, that he's going to tell us something about why our hydrilla across the south, and he basically says Florida to Texas, is different than the hydrilla up north. Now, as a young fisherman, never having fished outside of Arkansas and Texas, I always believed, uh, because of the guys in my bass club told me, that uh, there was hydrilla didn't grow in North Texas like it did at Toledo and Rayburn because the water got too cold. Well, of course, that's ridiculous because now I know that you can go to Michigan and fish lakes that are covered in hydrilla that are frozen most of the year. But John's now going to explain to us why that hydrilla and our hydrilla is the same but different and it's something that i guess because of the way it got in texas it's just the way it is um we can't really change it um uh, but it, it's just it blew my mind it's fascinating i hope you guys enjoy it uh, again this is part three of five and if you don't watch any other part of this video and you fish in the south you ought to watch this one because i think this is the most interesting one about why our hydro is different and again, it's right there. Here we go, guys. We talked a little bit about herbicides, but one of the things I found fascinating in our first conversation was um, the length of once that stuff gets in the water, how long is it, how long will it injure plants? How about that? It, it, that's going to, it depends on a lot of different things. First of all, the herbicide, I mean, things like sonar, some of the other, you know, herbicides that you would use to treat plants you're looking weeks you know it's a very slow release process some of them even have a slow release formulation into a pellet that slowly dissolves and releasing small amounts of herbicide over a period of time uh, whereas some of the other herbicides especially most of these that we use for salvinia uh, they're they're rapidly broken apart and i say rapidly if sometimes 48 hours is as long as they'll be uh I know with when we use glyphosate and uh, diquat, we've got to be real careful uh, getting a lot of mud and organic material in our uh, spray tanks uh, because it can break it down in as short as you know 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, glyphosate's a very weak bonded chemical and is rapidly broken apart uh, just by the organic material in the water. Uh, but you get you know you, so we got to look at organic material. We got to you know consider. Uh, Oh, I'm trying to think uh, water chemistry in that too. Uh, small changes in pH. pH is, is critical to it. Uh, one of the contact herbicides we use, flumioxazin, with a pH of 6.5, typically it's 24 to about 36 hours of activity in the water. And that's, that's at that pH 6.5. You increase that pH to 8, and we're talking 15 minutes. So a lot of times you don't even have enough time to get it out of the spray tank and that, that herbicide is already torn apart. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's, let's jump over and let's talk specifically about hydrilla. Okay. And, and kind of what's happened over the last few years. I mean, to me, a year and a half ago, Rayburn had a lot of hydrilla in it and, and Toledo five years ago had a fair amount of hydrilla in it. So What's the current belief of what's happened to the hydrilla and, and what are the steps being made to maybe try to remedy that? Okay. Now let, let's go with back to Toledo Bend because it's a lot, little bit farther back. Everybody, I mean, remembers the big rainfall event we had the spring of 2016. Uh, SRA was releasing almost 200 or right at 200,000 cubic feet per second uh, from the dam. That, that release flooded the city of Deweyville worse than what hurricane harvey did you know a year and a half later and, and it, that was a lot of water coming through there well when you bring that water down that much water down it's gonna it's gonna be muddy uh you know they they do hold uh have the ability to hold to lead a bend at a fairly constant level when they get those flood pulses in i mean it's not like rayburn where they'll store the water for a little bit and then let it let it down but we had muddy water in there so that's that's our best hypothesis on where all that main lake hydrilla went because it seemed to have disappeared almost all at the same time right. and we know we weren't putting you know at 5300 acres worth of herbicide 
in the lake at the time, 5,400 acres. On 180,000 acres. Right. On 180,000 acre lake, that wasn't enough herbicide to even put a dent in the hydrilla population, not to mention the fact that the herbicides, some of the herbicides we were using won't even have an impact on hydrilla. Like glyphosate is, you can't, glyphosate does not impact submerged species like hydrilla, Eurasian water milfoil, uh, even, even our pond weeds. Uh, and it, it'll tell you that on the label. Uh, so, you know, that wasn't being circulated. We know the herbicide was broken up pretty quick. So, you know, going back and looking at it, it had to be, you know, that muddy water event. We, we know it was, that water was muddy and it stayed muddy for a while. And it was kind of like we talked about in the first conversation about, you know, what happens if you, you were to go out in your yard and put a tarp over a section of your yard for a week and a half, two weeks, and then pull it up. Uh, that grass is dead under right. that tarp. You know, we've, we've completely blocked the sunlight out. So we, you know, we had that event come through in 16. And then by 2017, a lot of that the hydrilla was gone. Uh, now, we talked about Lowe's Creek and the torpedo grass, and, and we could also include Indian mounds. There was a lot of torpedo grass that was being sprayed there. That could, That's easily herbicide, you know, there on it. But back to hydrilla. So let's fast forward a, a couple of years and go into spring of 2018. Uh, Housing Bay, what is it, Community Hole Flats there? And housing that big shallow flat, uh, just what is that west of Hurricane? You know, notorious area for growing hydrilla. You could go and throw a red trap across the top of it. Uh, you catch bass. You catch large black crappie in the springtime. Well, I remember doing that. Uh, it, oh, uh, it, or February of eighteen. Went out there with one of the guys here at the office. He was pre-fishing for a bass champs tournament. We ended up over there on the flats. We were catching bass off the hydrilla. Everything was great. Two weeks before that Bass Champs tournament, there was a big rainfall event and housing got muddy and it stayed muddy for several weeks. And then what we see was that, you know, that hydrilla started to die out. We've seen the same thing throughout the state. When I was a fisheries biologist like Todd is oh, when I did that down in South Texas, uh, Coletto Creek Reservoir, a small power plant lake just outside of Victoria. Um, had about a thousand acres of salvinia or not salvinia i hope it doesn't get salvinia had a thousand acres of hydrilla and eurasian water milfoil uh it was you know great fish habitat a lot of bass it was it was a good you know bass fishing lake when choke canyon was down you could go to coletto creek but the lake was down to three and a half four feet uh six inch rainfall filled the lake up in a day uh but it left the, the water muddy and that hydrilla went away. This was the early 2010s, and the hydrilla and Eurasian water milfoil haven't returned at all. And there was no herbicide control being done there. And so you uh, you shared with me back to Toledo again that <laughs> that y'all have uh, recently Todd collected some uh, some soil for you, yeah, to look at to try to get a better understanding of why we're not seeing our hydrilla grow back. Well, exactly. You would think you know. Well, Let's, let's, let's go into one of the interesting facts we had talked about last time was the hydrilla in Texas. This blows my mind, by the way. I know. It, I, I have, I've looked it back up several times after we talked just to make sure, it, and it's there. But the hydrilla in Texas is all female. You, you'll see the flowers pop up in August, September. It'll be a little white flower, but we don't have the male hydrilla here. All we have is the female form. Now, if you go up into the Northeast, the hydrilla up there is, is, has both male and female parts to it. Uh, the biological term for the, the Northeast hydrilla is going to be monoecious or one plant having both sexes. Uh, whereas if you, you come in the South from Florida, you know, across to Texas, you have what's called dioecious organisms and these organisms are, are like humans you have a male and a female well in texas it's all female hydrilla so we know that hydrilla spreads through fragmentation you know you can break a piece off two or three inches long and let it float it'll find a shoreline and start growing roots we also know that you know it spreads through or tubers which are going to be like a, a small potato that grows in in the soil and then the other the other way it uh is able to replicate is through turions which looks like a, a small pine cone that would grow right where the, between the stem and the branch of, of the hydrilla. And, and those can fall and create new plants as well. So, you know, Todd and I, we spent a lot of time talking about fishing, let me, but let me stop you. So what you just said to me is 
most plants you have a male and a female and like um, for you know in my yard a bumblebee pollinates the male to the female and that's yes. what makes it grow right but in texas the only way for hydrilla to grow is literally for a piece of it to break off to float somewhere where it can root and then it starts growing and it can and, and does it right. then create can one stem can create 10, 10 stems though right sure Exactly. I mean, you, you run a boat motor through a mat of hydrilla. Think of all the little, you know, fragment pieces then that, that, that creates. And each one of those would then have the potential to become a new plant, you know, if it found a favorable shoreline. So is one stem of hydrilla a plant or is 50 stems a plant? Does that make sense what I'm asking? Well, the, the growth form of hydrilla, the best way I think of it is like a broom or a mop. You have that one stem that grows up from the bottom. And then that stem is going to branch numerous times up the top. So that way, I mean, you, you've punched grass before I've punched grass. That's why we have that thick mat up there. But if you go down below that mat, you know, it's, it's almost wide open. It, I was, I was driving home the other day, going through the Evangelina forest and I got to looking at the pine trees out there and I was like, you know, this is probably what it looks like underwater right with, a hyd with a hydrilla mat yeah. is that, you know, you have all of that, that upper story of the, of the pine forest growing, that would be the Mata hydrilla. But then down below, we just have the, the pine trunks or pine tree trunks, and that would be the stalks of the hydrilla growing. So it would seem then to make sense to me if we had the male form of hydrilla, that it would be both probably more durable and also proliferate better, right? Yes, yes, I durable. I'm, I'm not sure, but as far as, you know, proliferation, yes. Why would we then not import it? Is it just simply because it is an invasive species? It's on the prohibited list of, for the state of Texas and that, you know, we're not supposed to be in possession of it. That in Texas, that's actually a punishable, uh, with, as, as a class C misdemeanor with a, a fine of up to $500. Gotcha. So, and, and that, you know, possession can even be sitting on your boat trailer. Right. So, right. Yeah. I, I know right. that's the whole clean, dry and. Yep. Clean, drain, dry. Yeah. Clean, drain, so, dry. Yeah. That, that just, uh, again, that just fascinates me. And that also explains why on almost any lake, the first place you see hydrilla is around a boat ramp. Right. Exactly. Exactly. It gets brought in from a boat trailer. Same thing with Salvinia. Now what we're finding with Salvinia in some instances is not only you know, boat trailer introductions, but we have introductions up in some of the shallows, the waters and the upper ends of the reservoir, you know, it's way shallower than what, you know, somebody's going to take a, a bass boat or, or, you know, to even a John boat to go fishing. So, you know, now we got to thinking, well, how in the world is it getting up here? And, you know, one of the easier explanations, you know, from a human standpoint is introductions from duck hunters. You know, it wraps, it gets hung up in your decoy bag, gets hung up into the decoy line, that type of stuff. But it wouldn't surprise me now. I haven't seen any documentation of it, and that's either the literature ourselves, but just knowing how sticky that small juvenile salvinia, and it, and it can look like small duckweed, you know, could that, you know, hitch a ride on, on, a, on a duck Absolutely. or, you know, on other type of shorebird? We've seen salvinia get moved from across the street at Martin Creek with, by feral hogs. Yeah. There was no yeah. way it could have crossed it other than we, we, one side we looked and, you know, there was Salvinia and the hog wallows at the edge of the, the water sure. body went across the road and there, they were, there it was again, the whole, you know, acres of Salvinia, but that's where the pigs had been. Is there an animal that eats uh, Salvinia? We have a native moth here in Texas, uh, the Samia moth that will do some damage to the Salvinia. Uh, Lake Nacanish will see large uh, Samia outbreaks it'll turn the salvinia black i mean you think it's dying or, you know first few times we saw it we're like man our weevils are working you know this is great and you know a few weeks later it all turned green again and you know returned back to normal i think had you know the samia moth if if the reproduction of the moth was a lot longer let's say you know rather than a month it was several months long then you know maybe we would get some natural control of it and i'm sure we have some other animals out here that eat it uh you know, some of our, our herbivores and that type of stuff, you know, our ducks and that will, will eat it as well. Okay. And but by the go way, on. So well, one of the, and I can't remember if it was you and I or Todd and I talking about there's, I think there's been a misconception that fish 
leave an area when Salvania grows. But I think you guys have documented with shocking that that's not necessarily the case, right? Right. And it's the same thing with water high, same thing even water lettuce. We know that those mats of it can, you know, create shade and, you know, you can punch those mats as well. You know, the, if you can get a bait through, through that, you can catch fish through it. But the thing with Salvini is, is how fast it reproduces. You know, you might be able to get back in and, and fish an area, you know, one week, you go back two weeks later and you can't get 200 yards to that. I mean, and that's a great point. You, you talked about it doubles every, you said five days? Well, seven to 10 days, roughly, yes. Okay, so if it can double three times in a month, three to four times, you know, an acre becomes two, four, you know, it can be, an acre can right. be- Right, it's exponential. A foot can be eight feet of coverage in a month. Yeah, yeah. One football field becomes two football fields in a, in a, a week's time. What, do we know the growing season or temperature of, uh, I'm curious about, uh, Salvania and Hydrilla? Uh, Salvania, it never quits growing. It just slows down in the wintertime. Okay. Uh, and that's, that's why Parks and Wildlife has been pushing to do a lot of wintertime treatments. A lot of our native plants have senesced back for the winter, including Hydrilla. It, it'll die back and fall back in the cold weather. So, you know, and, and then our native plants die back. So there's less impact on non-target species just because they're not there by doing wintertime treatments uh there were there's a uh, a paper out and i'm trying to, i think it was lsu looked at doing uh aerial applications of herbicide on uh salvinia infestations uh in louisiana during the wintertime and they especially in the uh cypress breaks you know where the cypress tree once that cypress tree lost its needles then there was nothing for that cypress tree to absorb the herbicide it's not going to absorb it through the bark it's all through the the needle or the, or the leaf so they could come in and do aerial applications of diquat during leaf out which is you know when it's called whenever in the winter time when the plant loses its leaves so and, and have absolutely no impact on uh, uh the cypress trees interesting all right, I sidetracked you. So back to my original question. You guys pulled some of the soil out yes, of the bin. Right, right. Tell uh, us what so, you found and tell us what about it puzzled you. Okay, so that is uh, part three. We'll come back at part four and we'll talk about what they discovered by scooping up some mud, if you will, or what they're working on out of the bottom of uh, housing in Salida Bend to go look at it and examine it and try to figure out why the hydrilla has not grown back kind of as they expected it to after the high water event of a couple of years ago. So that'll be our next section. We're going to try to get some boat reviews done. We continue to try to do that. I know I keep saying that, but you guys know I'll get it done. We got the first one done. It's just a challenge with fishing and weather. So, and two little boys. So here we go. Uh, thanks for watching us and uh, we'll be back early next week with another video. Thanks guys.